How you doing, everybody? This is Alec Hyde coming to you from the 2019 Fred Hall Show. Uh, today's seminar I'm going to be showing you is the Ned Rig Finesse Fishing presented by Z-Man, um, hosted by Glenn Young. I think he's the uh, sales manager for the uh, company. I uh, hope you enjoy it, and I uh, hope you can see the actual action on the bait in the tank. It was kind of hard to film there. Yes. Check, check. Feel like I'm putting on a concert. Check, check. One, two. You always wonder how much that guy gets paid to come out and stand on stage and say check, check, one, two. Probably more than I make every year, but you know, somebody's got to do it. <laughs> Why not? Can I apply for that job? I, I wonder what that guy's resume looks like. Do you have to audition for that? All right. Let's get this show on the road. All right, so let's get this started. So I'm Glenn Young, National Sales Manager with Z-Man Fishing Products. Before we get too far along into this whole Ned Rig thing, let me ask a couple of questions. How many of you actually currently fish a Ned Rig? How many of you want to? <laughs> a lot more than what did. How many of you have no idea what this thing is but are just trying to figure this out? That's, there's even more hands right there. So the Ned Rig, basically, what I'm going to do is, and let me ask one more question. Does anybody know who this is named after? <laughs> you don't count. <laughs> Teacher's pet, come on now. <laughs> all right, so a little bit of background on the Ned Rig. First of all, I want you to understand the Ned Rig is really not just a rig. It's not just one bait. It's not just one head or one style of fishing. It's a technique and it comes down to, it's actually called the Midwest Finesse Technique. And it's developed by a guy named, this guy's excited, by a guy named Ned Cady. That's why it's called the Ned Rig. It's named after Ned Cady. And Ned Cady writes for In Fisherman Magazine. He's their finesse guru. And Ned, for decades, has been working on trying to develop a technique that gets bit in highly pressured waters. Because where he lives in Kansas, he fishes highly pressured public reservoirs all the time that just get pounded, hammered every day by power fishermen. And these fish just get pounded all the time. And so they're highly pressured. They're not always cooperative. So for decades, he's been working on dialing in a technique, a series of baits, a way to fish behind all these power guys in these publicly high pressured waters to still get bit. Now here's something to think about. The goal, when Ned goes out and the other guys that follow him, there's a whole finesse news network out there. The goal when these guys go out, they have a benchmark. When they go out, their goal is to get 100 bass in four hours where they fish. <laughs> it's like, wow, that's a lot. Believe it or not, they do it quite often. This is not just big bass. But the whole thing is, the whole goal is to try to get bit. Okay? So when they go out, that benchmark of 100 bass in four hours is held to quite often. Now, the first time I had the opportunity to actually fish with Ned Cady to help develop the stuff and work on this stuff, I went out, I just wanted to see what this was about. What's this guy doing? How is he fishing this stuff? I wanted to learn. I wanted to learn from the master himself. So we spent the whole day basically cutting down baits and stuff, and that's how all of this came about. Ned Cady experimenting with head weights, body shapes, all this stuff, cutting worms up, making his own stuff over the years. And the day that Ned and I went out, we actually did 104 bass in four hours. But we also caught 160 fish along the way. Ned only counts bass, but we caught every species of sunfish, walleye, crappie, trout, carp, catfish, everything else along the way. Anything we threw this technique in front of is what picked it up. And that's what makes it so effective. So when you look at the Ned rig, I want you to not think of it as one bait. It's a technique, it's a method. And it's a very deliberate method. The one thing you need to know about Ned Cady is that Ned has taken fishing to a level of nerd that I didn't think was possible, honestly. This guy is incredibly detail-oriented. His background was as an archivist for the state of Kansas. Okay, so he is incredibly detail-oriented. When we're on the boat together, he's got a clipboard and a counter. He can tell you what the barometric pressure is, what the water clarity is, the water temperature, the lunar cycle and everything else is going on at that time. But it's because of that level of detail that he was finally able to dial in a technique that can get bit anywhere. And that's what the Ned Rig is. So as an example of the level of detail that he took it to when we were fishing, 
picture this, he's in the back of the boat, I'm in the front of the boat as we're going along fishing these shorelines. We were catching like two fish at a time all day long. And Ned would keep notes and he would write stuff down. But the one that got me was we're bringing, we're both bringing in fish at the same time, caught off the same bank. Ned takes his time, he grabs his clipboard, hits his counter, and literally says, and I heard this out loud, I caught that fish on the 13th turn of the handle. <laughs> I looked like, what? I got my leg right there somewhere. I have no idea. I wasn't counting or paying attention. I'm just catching fish. I had no idea we were supposed to do it like that. But that's the level that Ned takes us to. I mean, he tracks everything and everything. So when you look at some of the things that we get a lot of comments, people look at the finesse room's heads and the weights that we have in there. They're weird. They're really weird. That's because the guys who helped develop this are weird. Okay, they're very, very particular about what they want. They have to have a specific fall rate, a particular action. This is very, very detail-oriented, which is why a lot of people overthink this whole thing and you don't have to. But you look at weights, we have a 120th, a 115th, a 110th, a 16th, a 15th. Weird weights. And people come up and like, well, what's the closest thing to 1 8? And then we have to have the pizza discussion. Okay, if I take a piece, if I take a pizza, I cut it into six pieces or five pieces, which pieces are bigger. So they kind of understand you know, the basic fractions that some of us didn't pay attention to in grade school. You need to pay attention to when you're doing the Ned rig. It's kind of important. But that's why we have those oddball weights in there. These guys wanted something very specific for exactly how they were fishing. That's why you see the different weights in there. So one of the things I'll tell you, so that first day that Ned and I went out, he's very, very focused on what he does. He fishes one way, one way only. A mushroom head, which is usually a gopher head, is what he likes to fish. And then a Ned Rick style bait. What, well, he discovered like our finesse shads, our TRD minnows, and he really loved our zinkers after the salt was gone. And that's what this is based off, which I'll get to in a second. But he would go by places while we were fishing and he wouldn't stop and fish them. It's like, Ned, why are we not fishing there? So well, I can't get my, my gopher head through there. But there's fish there. Why are we not stopping to fish that? Because I can't get my gopher head through there. He would not alter his technique or his setup to fish different areas. The one that got me though, and I just couldn't stand it anymore, we're going by one of the most picturesque, beautiful grass flats, and you had to draw a grass flat from scratch to put bass on, this was it. This was the angels singing in the background. This was Valhalla to me. But he's starting to cruise right by it. And I said, Ned, what are, we, what are you doing? He said, well, I can't bring my gopher through this. He said, there's fish in there. He goes, yeah, I know. Okay, well, would you mind if I made a few casts? He said, no, go ahead. So what I did, this was at the time we had the TRD minnows. That's what Ned and I were throwing. So I took that bait and I rigged it unweighted on a one-aught EWT so I could keep it up on the surface because the material's buoyant. So I threw it up over that grass flat and I caught four nice bass in a row on that off that grass flat doing this. Ned's reaction was classic. I was like, wow, that is fascinating. And then just kept right on going. So he still wouldn't stop and fish it. That's how focused this guy is on what he does. So when we look at the Ned rig, I want you to really think about the fact that it's a technique, it's a method. It's not just a bait. This is the bait that kind of got the whole thing rolling, which is called the Finesse TRD. Does anybody know what TRD stands for? You don't count, neither do you, Henry. Yeah. The real deal. The real deal. We called it the real deal because for decades guys have been cutting up baits and altering and doing all this kind of stuff. We designed this bait from scratch to be the real deal Ned Rig bait. That's why it's called the real deal. It also allowed us to call it a turd because that's what it's been called forever. Guys cut up little baits, they call them turd rigs, dookie rigs, all kinds of different stuff. So we wanted to be able to at least keep that familiarity with all these guys that have been doing it forever. It's like, still, it's, it's a turd. And that's what we're throwing. We're throwing a turd. So when you look at the TRD, you can look at that and go like, well, there's not a lot to it. Why do fish eat it? There is actually some science behind this design. I want you to stop to think about the fact that every year, crawdads mold. And when they do, oftentimes they'll lose their claws in the process. And when they do that, that's what they look like. So every fish that swims has been hardwired to recognize that as food. That's one of the reasons it's so effective. The other reason is this, it can mimic any other type of forage. 
And when you think about a bass, they're nothing more than basically a toddler with fins. If they want to know what something is, they put it in their mouth. They don't have hands. They can't go up and look at it and go, oh, what is that? Oh, that feels kind of cool. No. They have to put it in their mouth to figure out what it is. And there's no reason that they can't do it with something like that. There's no spines, legs, nothing on there to prevent them from putting it in their mouth. And that's why they do so readily. So there, it's safe, it's food, it can resemble any number of different things. So it's going to come down to your presentation. And I can boil it down to two basic presentations for you. And from there you can take it as far as you want. But you either have a hard bottom or a soft bottom. If you have a hard bottom, that's where you let this bait go to the bottom. You fish it on the hard bottom, you drag it, you hop it, you bring it through. So if I have a hard bottom, typically what I'll do is I'll take this bait and I want to let it get to the bottom. So I put it out and I let it get to the bottom. <laughs> because on a, you know, but on, a, on a bait like this, the advantage you have is that this bait is point. Let go, buddy. Come on. Let me, let me do my job here. Come on. This bait is point. So what happens when it does get to the bottom without being molested on the way down? Come on now. Let go. Let go. Come on, buddy. I need you to let go. There's no hook on there. Thank you. Uh, they hang on to this stuff. The stuff is so soft. There's no reason for them to spit it out. But you have to have buoyancy. That's what makes this technique work. A regular piece of plastic, anything made out of plastisol, is not necessarily buoyant. And it tends to lay flat on the bottom. When you have a buoyant material that stands up, that's what gets noticed. It's seen, it's noticed. The fish can pick that thing up. They know that something's there. And the other thing is, with something like that, once it's on the bottom like that, with that buoyancy, come on buddy, thank you. What you get is you have the ability to now slow down your presentation. And this is what I tell people with the Ned Rig. And it's hard for a lot of us to do because I don't know how many people are ADD, I am. It's kind of hard to slow way down. But the thing I tell people with this bait and this presentation is when you're fishing this bottom presentation out here, once you think you're going slow, go even slower. Slow it down even more. You have to be willing to be patient in order to do this properly. So that's one technique. So the technique is, and you'll see this, I have a handout that you can see right here on this, on the video monitor. I have these hands out to, handouts in our booth to kind of show you the different ways to retrieve a Ned Rig and how to fish it. That kind of breaks down that soft bottom, hard bottom, thank you buddy, um, type of presentation. Now the other thing that you do, and this is what I do, there's two presentations. The other one now is to talk about soft bottom. You have a soft bottom, you have grass. You have things that you cannot allow this bait to get down into that now. You somehow have to keep it above that. That's why we have the head weights that are as light as 1 20th of an ounce, which is what I have on here. I want to be able to slow this thing down. When I get into a soft bottom situation, I'm not letting it get to the bottom. When I get to a soft bottom presentation, now everything changes. So my soft bottom, I throw it out and I retrieve it. I swim it back. And I do very slow turns of the handle and little gentle flicks of the rod tip to give that bait all the action I need. Because when you look at something like that, it doesn't look like it'll have a lot of action to it. But when you give it just little gentle flicks of the rod tip, that's enough to impart action into this bait so that even on a very slow retrieve, very little movement of my rod tip. I can get a swimming, darting action and the tail will bounce on the way back. And that's what I'm looking to get. I want a little bit of action on that. So a lot of people here have their favorite bodies of water they go to. You know where your fish are. You fish it all the time. What I do when I get to places where I'm very familiar, my first presentation is always the swimming presentation. I want to know what mood these fish are going to be in today. They want to chase stuff, and they want it on the bottom. So I start off with a swimming presentation. I move it. Let go, buddy. I try to move it and bring it through. Let go. Thanks. Come on now. There you go. Because that's going to tell me what they want. So I'll bring it to an area. If I know the fish are going to be there, that's where I want to do the swimming presentation. Is it a reaction bite today? Do they want something swimming? Or are they one of those who's like, dude, I'm just tired. Let's just order a pizza. 
And you know, so that's that's the kind of mood where they're in that, that's the one you let it get to the bottom, and that's where you slow it down. You put it on the bottom, you let it sit there, and you just do a slow drag along the bottom. And if you're gonna do a hopping technique, this is something I want you to keep in mind. I want you to try to look at, I'm gonna put this back out there. I want you to watch how much this bait moves with how little action of the rod I put into it. Because so many people overwork this. You don't need to overwork this. So when this gets down to the bottom, if I do, get the light to do this. Very little, very little. There's a lot of action on that bait. If I move my rod this far, my bait moves this far. That's what you have to understand is that very little movement on your part puts a lot of movement on the bait. So a lot of people are getting in there and doing big hops. They're, they're overworking it. You don't need to do that. Keep it subtle. Very, very subtle. A little bit of this on the rod tip is a lot of this underwater. So you have to understand that. <laughs> that is, thank you buddy. These guys are pretty cooperative today. So you have your swimming technique, you have your bottom technique. Now, what we've done though, we've added to that Nedrick family to, we have baits like this, which is a very realistic crop pattern called the TRD crop. All right, and a bait like this, you've got, you've got crossies. I mean, this is a common forage bait in most bass fisheries. There are crawdads everywhere. Everybody eats these things. Now, when you present something like this, again, you want to look at hard bottom, soft bottom. Do I want to swim it? Do I want to bring it back? So, when I put this guy on the bottom, the advantage of having something this buoyant is that when I do put this guy on the bottom out here, what happens is on a weighted hook, he hits the bottom, the claws float up. And that's an important part of that presentation. That's what happens with the crawdad in nature. When they get to the bottom, those claws go up into a defensive position. That's what they look like on the bottom. Now the other way to present this, again, we talked about hard bottom, soft bottom. One of the things I love to do with this bait, and if you're fortunate enough to have clear water, what I'll do is I'll fish this bait on a swimming presentation, and this is the key. If you happen to see somebody chasing it, so if I'm bringing this through and I'm darting it through and I can dart it through and somebody's looking at it, I stop it. I let it go to the bottom. Claws go up, like I dare you to eat me. And I haven't seen too many bass that go, nah, you're right, I don't want to. Of course they're gonna eat them. They're gonna look at that idea, you need me. Well, you asked for it, so of course I'm gonna eat you. And that's what happens. So when those claws go up in that natural defensive position, that's exactly what happens in nature. When a fish is pursuing a crawdad, that crawdad's gonna stop, he's gonna flare up, he's gonna put his claws out like, you don't know. No, 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 you don't wanna do this. And the bass is like, yeah, I kinda do. And that's why they pick him up like that. You know, so you have that situation where you can just kind of hop along the bottom. Little twitches of the rod tip is all it takes. It doesn't take much. You've got a very soft material. You have buoyant claws. You have a buoyant material that just kind of sits there. Floats up on the bottom. Provides a lot of action without you having to impart a lot of it on the part, on the part of the rod. So if you watch this guy swim, when he's swimming back, little tiny twitches of the rod tip is all I need. And you can see him dart. You can see the claws move. He's a fleeing crayfish. He's afraid of something, of somebody. Because guess what, that is everybody's dinner right there. There's an fish alive out there who doesn't want to eat a crawdad. They all love them, they're sweet and delicious, especially in butter. So you have that, and then if you're going to put this thing on the bottom and leave it down there, then that's where you know I want you to go back and I want you to slow it down. I want you to slowly just kind of crawl them on the bottom, or none of my line's tight, you can see him. Very little movement of that, a lot of movement with him. A little movement there, doesn't take much. Doesn't take much at all. That's a very gentle little flick of my rod tip. And it doesn't take much to move him. So don't overwork this thing. And that's the biggest problem people have with this. They overwork all of these. And you don't need to. Keep it very simple, keep it very, very subtle. That's the key to having success with the Ned Rig. Slow it down. Take your time, understand that this much of your rod tip movement is this much of bait movement underwater. Slow it down, stop overworking this thing. You don't need to do that. It's gonna be very effective. The slower you are, the better it's going to be. So, so Henry, if you can come over and do me a favor. So, one of the things that I want you guys to understand too is, is 
the line that we use when we do a net rig, it's a very light line technique. It's a finesse technique. You're not going to go tie a 50 pound braid to one of these things and chuck it into heavy cover. That's not what this is for. This is a finesse technique. Typically, the rod and reel setup and the line setup on, a, on one like this, what I typically like to have is I've got braided lines, so like Seagar smack down, and then I've got a Seagar leader on the end of it, and they're usually eight pound. And that's more than enough. The thing is, you know, with seat, with uh, with floor carpet, especially guys think they can cheat a little bit more, go heavier and heavier. And yeah, you can because it's invisible. But the key to this is, when you go heavier line, you stiffen up that bait. You still want movement, you still want action out of it. And if you go 10, 12, 15 pound line, you're starting to kill the action of that bait, the heavier the line you go. And so this is one of the things that I wanted to demonstrate. So come on down, Henry. So let me get uh, this guy right here. You, you're my guinea pig. Come on up. So here's what I want you to do. Henry's gonna take this rod. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand it to you. Hand him that rod. So I want you to back up a little bit from Henry over there. Hand him the rod tip. So this is something, when you guys get home, I want you to do this with your equipment. Because I don't think any of you actually understand how hard you're pulling. How many pounds are you lifting right now? Lift, lift. How many pounds is that? Broke the line, that's okay. Grab the rod tip, Henry, just pull down on it. So how many pounds are you lifting? What does it feel like? Give me a number. <laughs> if I tried to stick a butter to the end of that, you'd be lucky to lift it off the ground right now. So switch it around, hand Henry to the other side of that rod. What you feel on your end is not what's going on out here in the water. Okay? Lift. Just the very end. There you go. Lift. So now, how much do you feel on your end? <laughs> Nothing, right? This is why people say, well, how can you, how can I fish six pound line and catch a 10 pound bass? You're not pulling 10 pounds. That fish in here does not weigh 10 pounds in this water. He's weightless in here, guys. He doesn't weigh 10 pounds. What you're fighting is you're fighting his ability to swim. You're fighting his athleticism. What breaks line is shock, abrasion, things like that. Not the weight of this fish. This guy doesn't weigh 10 pounds in here. And now you understand that, right? So you're like, if I, because I've done this, this clinic offshore too, for big blue water fishing. And I'll tie a four pound weight to a giant blue water rod and dare somebody to lift that off the ground. And you can't do it, I'm telling you right now. There's a huge difference between what you feel on your end and what's going on out there. That's why we can get away with light line. We're not pulling eight pounds. A 10 pound fish does not weigh 10 pounds here. He doesn't weigh 10 pounds, so you lift him out of the water. Now he's 10 pounds, and there he's not. So that's one of the things you need to understand when you're fishing. That's why you can use light line and get away with it. You're not pulling as hard as you think you are. And it's a big reality check. So when you get home, grab your buddy at home and go, all right, tell me how many pounds you're lifting. He's like, ah, 20, 30. And you're sitting there holding it like this, like, you haven't moved my hand yet. So there's a big difference out there. So let me show you one other option here that you have. We just released this, actually. And what this is, is uh, when you're fishing the Nedrick, people ask about colors. Colors is a big factor. Not specific colors, but just either dark or light. That's what it comes down to. So when you look at your water conditions, if you have a bright day, clear water, sunny conditions, colors show up. Now, they can be seen. You have light penetrating the water. They can see stuff now. So you can have colors like a copper truce or things with a lot of flash in it and stuff, because guess what? They get seen then. If you have dark, cloudy water and a, and a dark day overcast and a little bit of stained water, that same copper truce doesn't show up like you did before. It doesn't look nearly the same. That's where you want to go to more of a darker, solid profile because that's what's going to be seen. So, let me, get this, let me trim this off here real quick. So we just came out with one other option because there are times where the guys still want to throw this finesse stuff, but they don't necessarily want to, you know, go to a bigger bait or anything. But you need a little attraction. We introduced a little spinner system you can put in the back of the TRD or any other finesse bait. It's called the TRD Spins. And it sticks in there, and the thing is, it, it goes into the elastic and it doesn't come out. It stays right in there. But what it does is it adds a little bit of flash now. So if I have stained water, or I'm just trying to cover water, now I have something that throws a little bit more attraction behind that TRD, okay, so I can still slow my presentation way down, <laughs> but
but I do get a little bit of extra splash in there now. So I do add a little bit more attraction to my bait than what I had before. So if it's something where I just want to, come on buddy, when I need that little extra splash, a little extra traction there, I have that option. Most of the time, if you're fishing clear waters, you really don't need that. Most of the time, clear waters, that's where you want to experiment. You want to be able to throw your, you know, your brighter colors. You want to experiment with your swimming techniques. You want to experiment with the bottom technique. But figure out what the fish want ahead of time. Okay, because what they tell you on your first few presentations is going to hold true the rest of the day. If you start hitting them right away in that swimming presentation, that's your trick the rest of the day. Period. If they're not biting that, but you know they're there, go back in, slow down, put it on the bottom. They pick it up. All right, I just figured it out. Now I have my pattern for today. This is what they want. They want the bottom presentation, not the swimming one. Because a lot of places that I fish, I know exactly where they are. So the first thing I do is I start with that swimming presentation. If they hit that, thank you. That's what I needed to know. Now I have my presentation for the rest of the day. I'm going to cast it out, swim it back, and, and then I've got my presentation. So that's really all I need to know. The fish are going to tell you what they want to do. You just have to be willing to listen. And you have to be willing to slow down. So like I said, the second you think you're going slow, go even slower. Thank you. So do I have any questions out there? We've covered a lot, yeah. What's that? I do, actually, I've gone down. Seagar makes a line called Finesse Floor Farm. It's very technique specific. And I've used, they make one that's 5.2 tenths. It says 5.2 because that's actually what it breaks out. Because the problem with line is most lines are overrated. It's like, this is the strongest six pound you'll ever use. Breaks at 20. Well, it's not six pound then, is it? <laughs> no, it's right. So that's the thing when you're looking at line, you got to keep that in mind. What's the actual breaking strength? What's the diameter? And the thing with fluorocarbon, because this stuff's invisible, people cheat a little bit more. Because you can. They're not going to see it. So why not go a little bit heavier? So in a lot of situations, I may have to use five or six pound line, but I've got fluorocarbon, I'll go eight. Because I can. They're not going to see it. I'll take that advantage every day. If I can go heavier, I will. I like to pull on stuff. It's fun. You know, the thing with, the, the, I've used that 5.2 for a long time and I was just around. The only time I ever had a problem with it was when I actually pulled 5.3 pounds on a fish. Then I had an issue. But other than that, it's been just fine, you know? Because like you, now that you understand, there's a difference between how much you're pulling and how much pressure you're actually putting on the fish in the water. There's a huge difference. That's why I can go light line and get away with it. And what's gonna break him off is not his weight, it's his shot, it's his ability to fish. He took me around a rock, he hit a piling. He went under a dock, I'm done. You know, if you're going to be in those areas, then that's when you do have to upgrade your line. You wanna go heavier if you can. That's the reason we developed hooks like the Ned Locks as a heavier duty, heavier duty hook. The finesse bullets that we have now, heavier duty hook, we use that on redfish in South Carolina where we're based. Because all this stuff, just so you know, all this stuff is made in Charleston, South Carolina. That's where our factory is. It's all made right there. Now the last tech is a non-toxic material, no PVCs, no phthalates. It's naturally buoyant and, like we've already said, doesn't rip or tear like a regular plastic does. So basically, once you rig a Ned rig on, you're done for a while. And we actually had a guy send us one that he had actually caught 238 bass on. That's a little bit excessive. And basically what we told him is like, that's great, but would you just please cut that off and tie a new one on. It's really not that great for sales if you're gonna use one that long. And we get that a lot. People are like, how are you gonna sell if they last that long? Well, basically what we do is we have a nationwide campaign right now where we go around and we plant rebar and chicken wire in all the popular fishing areas so that people will break off a little bit more and start buying more baits. That's the only way we can do it. But you know, it's, it's a business. We gotta do what we gotta do. So essentially that, is your Ned rig. So I have these handouts that you see right here. I have these in our booth. Um, Turner's has everything available right there. And I'll do one more thing. I want to cover the rod real quick because I didn't say about that. The rod tip, you see how flexible this rod tip is? That's what you have to have for the Ned rig. The reason is this, I'm throwing 1 20th of an ounce. You think I can butt load a rod from here with 1 20th of an ounce? No, I can't. I have to tip load it. 
and I can't tip load a fast action rod with no flexibility in the tip. I have to be able to have that tip flex and throw because I can't load it from here. This stuff's too light. So when you're looking for an ideal Ned Rig rod, this is the Turner Californian right here, but when you look for an ideal Ned Rig rod, you want that flexible tip, you want that light rod with that flexible action on it. Still has a little bit of backbone in the butt, but you've got to be able to tip load these things to load yeah. something that light. That's the only way you can do it. Right, any other questions at all? What's yeah? your boat? Cool. All right, well, if you guys have any questions at all, we'll be in the Z-Man booth right over there. Turner's has all this stuff in their booth for sale right over there, too. You can check out the rods. You can check out all of these baits, all the different hooks. They have all that stuff. Up there. And thank you for coming. You guys have been awesome. Everybody, thanks for stopping by. I really appreciate you checking out my video. If you have a chance, please hit like and subscribe. Comment below if you can. Let me know what I'm doing wrong or what I'm doing right, what you'd like to see more of, anything of like, like that. Um, anyways, we'll catch you next time. Take care. Bye.